Good evening, everybody. This is Pete Morris on uh, Comanche Zoom. We are on uh, July 23rd, and the uh, subject tonight is long distance flying with Ron Keel. And have at it. Here we go. Okay. Anybody wants to talk? Go ahead and unmute yourself. <laughs> well, Hello, I just want to say it's great to be here. Hey, Bernie. Well, this is my memorial. Um, I got to go get a fruity drink and raise a glass to Comanche Town and Oshkosh. So, um, everybody, I miss you. I wish we were all at Oshkosh drinking fruity drinks. Who else had planned to be at Oshkosh? Oh, hey. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, this is Kim Azion. I'm uh, actually new to this. Um, Actually, I'm still a Comanche owner, but uh, just about to sell the the, the bird. Uh, I, I've got a 1959 uh, 180 at Charlie Foxtrot India Victor Zulu. I am in Saskatchewan, Canada, and uh, I flew the bird uh, for about a thousand hours, all the way down uh, to Mexico and uh, all over the United States and Canada. So uh, I've got about a thousand hours on it. That's who I am. Welcome and thanks for joining us. A thousand hours in all those places. This is definitely the right seminar for you to join us. Yeah. Well, hey all, jump in and say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. If you've got a quiet voice. And I guess I should say I'm CJ. Um, I fly Bernie's 260B and uh, Comanche 180 that I'm plane sitting for somebody who's stationed overseas. Love them both. And I'm based out of uh, uh, either Lebanon, New Hampshire, or Montpelier, Vermont. I'm Pete Morris. I've got a Comanche 250 that I have here at uh, Danielson, Connecticut. And I've been flying since 2002 in Comanches. I do angel flights. I do young eagle flights. And I just do everything I can for anybody else. I'm uh, Bernie Stumpf. I'm CJ's dad, and she flies with me when she isn't flying on some, with somebody else's airplane. Uh, 85 Pop I've owned since 95 uh, from a guy that was paraplegic and uh, um, had a hand control that uh, for, for the rudder pedals. Um, and he was amazing what he could do. With, but I've taken the air, that airplane to the West Coast a few times, to Florida multiple times, and uh, um, and that's uh, those are my principal uh, long distance trips: are Florida and the West Coast. West Coast has been uh, places like uh, um, Vancouver or, or Victoria, and also um, Oregon and th that area. Um, South Florida has been uh, uh, Fernandina Beach and one time, and it's been uh, the West Coast, Southwest Coast, like St. Pete's Beach and uh, uh, Venice and places like that. So uh, the plane has gotten around, but in the last five years, I've barely hit 100 hours a year. My name is Craig Hammond. I'm from uh, Fort Oklahoma, bought in Fort Sill, and I fly a 250. Had it since about 2002. Lately, I've been doing a lot of uh, upgrades, like electronic ignition, dual exhaust, uh, the uh, shoulder harnesses. So, some money on here recently. Looking forward to uh, maybe doing some more in the future. I think you'll need to unmute. Welcome aboard.
Hello, everybody. It's Matthew Smith. Good to see you all. Sorry I missed last week, but uh, I uh, based out of Hawthorne. I fly a 260B, and uh, last week I flew it 41 hours from California to Utah to Texas to Alabama to Florida, Georgia, Arkansas, uh, Oklahoma. Arizona and back to California again. So I'm very interested to uh, see what sort of uh, excellent long distance flying tips we get today. Good to see you and Matthew. Um, his, his email is oneredjeep at gmail.com. I mentioned this because Matthew is pulling together and scanning online and doing optical character recognition so they could be searched. All Comanche documents, uh, manuals, um, part stuff, uh, and now 337. So if you've got Comanche documents, and you can send them to Matthew, email them to oneredjeep at gmail.com. And uh, a side note on that, <clears throat> I think since the last time I mentioned this, there's a much more, a much simpler address to remember. It's now pipercomanche.info or docs docs.northeastcomanche.org. They both contain the same information. They're two standalone copies. Uh, I push updates to both of them every time. And in the past few days, I've gotten uh, a couple of new uh, aircraft owners' handbooks. Uh, Ernie and Mike sent me, uh, let's see, a 260, 1965 260 owners' handbook and uh, the PA-30B model uh, owners' handbook. So those are up now. Uh, and uh, a better copy of the service manual for the twins. So it's good stuff up there. If you need your uh, documentation, swing by and grab it. And if you have something I'm missing, uh, feel free to ping me, oneredjeep at gmail.com, or find me on the Facebook group, uh, and I, uh, I will get that up there. If anyone has a copy of the uh, Aircraft Owner's Handbook for the uh, 260B model, uh, I would love to have that because I don't actually I don't actually have one of those aircraft owner handbooks for my plane. I have a you know plane specific POH, but not the neat little information book. Are you looking for the original one or the later one? The I think it's whatever the latest version of it's that part number uh seven five three six nine six. I guess it's the original one. Um I have the I have the first the 1965 uh, 260, and I have the 260C, but I don't have the B model yet. So, if anyone has Bernie, that, <laughs> Bernie, I think has both. So let's get you guys in touch. Yeah, Matt, maybe you can put those two uh, <laughs> website addresses into the chat window. Sure. I will paste those there now. Matt, how Perfect. would you like? To, how would you like to get the 260B manual in the postal mail or scan a few pages or something? Oh, I prefer the best way is a, a scan, a scanned PDF, um, is the is the easiest way. I haven't actually I haven't actually uh, done any that I had to receive via the postal mail and scan myself. Which that we could arrange that. But uh, if if anyone has a PDF copy of any of that stuff, that's the simplest, most straightforward way. Good deal, and uh, yeah, and then if you also toss, it's about a hundred pages. So I. I'm reluctant to scan a hundred pages, but uh, maybe, that, maybe there's another way to do it. If anyone already has a scanned copy, that'd be great. If there is no scanned copy, then I can, uh, yeah, well, we can figure something out. I, I don't mind yep. shipping it back and forth and scanning it. Good deal. Cool. And if you just joined, uh, just hop on and the uh, moment there's a quiet spot, just say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Welcome. Hank Spellman, uh, 5903 Pop, a 1958 Comanche 250 in the flatlands of Illinois at Kilo Alpha Alpha Alpha. Manny Wolf, currently in Tucson, Arizona, where we finally have some monsoon rain, thanks God. I've got a PA-30 serial number 105. Had it since 76. That's awesome. Um, 
Just a quick question. Has anybody had their Comanche since before 1976 that's on right now? Uh, the unmute button is generally uh, uh, there somewhere. It'll look like a little microphone with a cross on it. <laughs> Manuel looks like you're our leader at the moment. And if you just... Oh. What, what does that mean? Pat, Pat Kiefer actually just beat you. 1970. <laughs> Got their PA30 new from the factory. Oh my. My, air, my aircraft is a 1963, if that counts. No, I think it's lunch. Sorry, Don, keep going. I apologize. Oh, that's all right. Lovington, New Mexico. I got a 1966-260B. Welcome, Don, and thanks for joining. Okay. More, more information for you folks. I was an Air Force flight surgeon and a retired AME. Wow. Oh, you know, um, Emmanuel, I need to put you in touch with our very first Comanche Zoom presenter. This is CJ again, Tom Wasser, who's a former F-16 flight surgeon and has been an AME for 50 years. Yeah. Um, if you throw your contact information into the chat window, I'll, I'll introduce you guys if you'd like. Yeah, now I gotta figure out how to do that. <laughs> Um, and everybody, when you're listening to Ron's Prezo, there's going to probably be a lot of questions if our pre-flight last night, our test flight last night is any indication. If you find the chat window as Ron's talking, uh, you can go ahead and just type any questions you have into that window, and we will cover all of those. Uh, that way, Ron gets through it and all the questions get asked. We asked you to put them in the chat window because there are people who join from, hey, Emmanuel, it worked. There are people who join from... Um, uh, just dial up because not everybody wants to get on from a computer or a phone and that way everybody can hear the questions. Um, sorry to take the time and uh, feel free to jump in, say who you are, where you are and what you're from, uh, sorry, what you fly. The other, the other good thing about the chat window is that whatever is in there is saved so we can go back and review it. Oh, well, that's not good. So, um, that does, it does not save the private ones. If you send something private to somebody, only you and that person see it. Okay. I don't know if this is going out. Dan Homaser, Kenosha, Wisconsin. A 19... Okay, good. A 1960 was originally a 180, but converted at some point to a 250 Comanche at Charlie 89. I'm Stephen Lasky from Littleton, Colorado. I fly a 59 model 180 out of Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport, north east, northwest side of Denver. Sweet. Welcome, Dan and Steve. Hello, yeah. kind folks. My name no, is... Uh, it's Mark. okay. That's the proper name. Sorry, Mark. Go for it. Hello, folks. It's Mark Sarif calling from Sydney in Australia, and I'm enormously grateful to you guys for extending your podcast or your, your Zoom meeting to us. I fly a PA thirty eight B, which has had the twin, uh, the the alternate, uh, the which has had the conversion, so that I have counter rotating engines. Many of you will know my aircraft. It used to belong to the wonderful Frank Sargent, one of the members up in Washington State. Oh, you are from Frank's airplane, <laughs> and Donald Gart. Um, uh, sorry. Um, so there is another aircraft that went over with a, a, another Australian that's got an American airplane that's on here, David Housen. I don't know if he's on tonight, but if you guys haven't met each other yet, um, you're both flying aircraft that came over from the U.S. and Australia. Welcome and thanks Thank for joining, Mark. Thank you. And you guys are the masters at long distance flying there. <laughs> so your country's so big. And yet the curious thing is most Australian twin Comanches have uh, tip tanks fitted, but mine doesn't. 
And you guys at least have places to refill every 15 minutes by the looks of things. The U.S. is truly blessed with a lot of air with a lot of airports, and we're trying to figure out how to save them so <laughs> that we continue to be blessed. Um, thanks for being here. Everybody else, just jump in. This is Jim Brown. I fly a 1959 uh, Comanche 180 out of uh, Detroit, Willow Run, and I do have tip tanks on my 180. So you can imagine how far the 180 goes, a lot farther than I can go. <laughs> that is brilliant. On the other hand, you get to get all the cheap fuel. <laughs> That's exactly what I use it for. Right. Welcome, Jim, and another Oshkosh refugee, I expect. <laughs> Yes. Well, raise a glass to uh, Oshkosh and Comanche Town, everybody. Uh, jump in. Hey, and I'm going to jump in here with the uh, commercial messages uh, on behalf of all the people who are working on this stuff. And share the screen. This is the, uh, the website for the Northeast Tribe, which is what's hosting all of these Zoom things when you want to see them. Uh, to get there, you simply type northeastcomanche.org, and that will bring you right to this page. Uh, we have a whole bunch of different things on the site, but I want to point out, here's the Comanche Zoom page. You click on that. I've modified it slightly. Now it has the Zooms ahead. These are the ones that are upcoming, although there are no, there's only one that has a date. That's tonight's. But the, the rest of them, not necessarily in this order, but this is the kind of stuff you might expect to see. And then below it is a link that goes to the page that has all of the Zoom uh, recordings. In this case, for instance, the one that got away here that Hans Neubert did, you go over here and click on this link and that will take you to a page describing what that is and a link to the Zoom recording. There's a whole bunch of other things on here too, uh, like a little one down here that I did this past week, how to plan a fly-in. Someone was asking that and we figured we might as well do it. So there's a 10 minute mini Zoom on how to do that. We're going to get some more of those going on in the future. If we go back to, oops, here we go, back here, uh, tribe documents. I want to point these out. We have a membership app application. If you want to be a member of the Northeast Tribe, it does not include ICS, does not require ICS. There is also a, uh, an election coming up. We're having, uh, in August, we're going to be doing an election, and we need people to apply. Here is the, right here is the link for an application for one of the tribe officers. Your name, your hometown, which office you would like to have it for, and then what is your vision for the Northeast Tribe? What experiences do you bring to your desired tribe office? And what do you see as the role of the Northeast Tribe rep to the ICS board of directors? This has been a really uh, fuzzy question. These We want to get some good answers. And then the opportunity, if you don't get elected, would you serve as a, uh, an advisory? And that's all the kind of stuff that's on there on this web page. There's also other things like the, all the nor'easters. So there's a link to go to those things. And uh, there's the fly-in schedule. We actually have a fly-in coming up. As you can see, there's a bunch of red ones that got canceled. But Katama, we actually did the fly-in, although only one person really got there. We went to a whole bunch of different airports and had a fly-in at a distance. The next one we're having is August 22, Sky Manor. That is our usual uh, annual meeting, and it will be the, the really the end of the election at that point. The following week is when we will be counting the ballots. Once again, we are doing the election by a paper ballot that we've mailed out to the people who are on the tribe list. And I think that's about all I had to say. If there's any questions, you know, I'm Pete Morris, give me some questions. We got about 10 minutes or so before the actual presentation starts, so here's your chance to have at it. I think Hans Niebert was just about to introduce himself, Pete. Uh, just one quick thing, um, whether you are ICS or not, everyone is welcome. Um, so if you're ICS, you're welcome. If you're not ICS, you're welcome. If you're if you like Comanches, we're just happy to have you here. Um, Hans, go for it. Hi there. Well done. I assume you can hear me. Yes. yes. No. Okay. 
Um, what can I say? Uh, anything you want me to talk about? Well, Hans, uh, who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Okay. Uh, I have a 64 twin, uh, heavily modified, got a fancy paint job. I'm based in Chino, California, live in Anaheim Hills, so it's 18 miles to the airport. And uh, as a matter of fact, I, I've just been notified yesterday of a problem with the twins. And it was a gentleman in Alaska that called me and he bought a twin in Minnesota for a parts airplane. But the mechanic that was inspecting the airplane found a spar crack on the inside uh, due to corrosion and a spark crack due to exhaust gases leaking into the wing on one of the access panels. I'll probably go out Saturday to uh, inspect my airplane just, and just to verify the location. But he's looking for me to uh, develop a, uh, a repair sufficient for a ferry permit because he has to fly the airplane to Alaska. So that's latest on the scene is uh, looking for corrosion on the inside of the wing due to exhaust gas. That's it. Hans, uh, Hans this is uh, Mark speaking from Australia. Um, in their wisdom, our regulatory authority here required an, a drain to be inserted into every auxiliary tank of the Comanche. And so the, uh, many of the Australian uh, aircraft have had this problem because the hole that was punched in the skin clearly admitted the gases. So uh, if you know the tech guys here, they may have a bunch of ready-made uh, methods for you. Well, I do have the Australian technical paper. Cool. Uh, let's see here, I'll reach over and get it. Uh, uh, AWB 51-4 issue 1 Piper PA 3039 wing spar cap corrosion and it's dated uh, 27th of September uh, 2002 and it describes what's going on and there's a picture on page 3 and what I want to do is go out and validate the location to be sure and to inspect my airplane at the same time. I'll, the fix I'll probably come up with is a, um, I, I, I need to talk to the mechanic tomorrow. Uh, the fix I'll probably come up with is a, uh, uh, a fairly long bonded on strap on the outside of the spar. That, that, that's sufficient to carry the load. So that's what I'm going to do. Hey Hans, Mark Sullivan. Um, I've got a 1966 Turbo Twin Comanche. About 20 years ago, I put on the Nats to You exhaust mod. And I don't know if you're aware of that. That's one with the stainless steel plate that covers over that indent area under the nacelle where the exhaust goes. Um, I'm thinking the way my airplane is, it's just completely slick, you know, just flat on the bottom of the wing, stainless, back to the trailing edge of the wing. I, I don't see any way exhaust could get in there. I'm wondering if that's a, you know, a prophylactic fix for that problem. Well, uh, I, I have the notch to you uh, fairing as well. I also made my own, um, uh, exhaust extensions that bend down. So the exhaust in my airplane uh, doesn't hit the bottom of the wing anymore. It, it goes into the slipstream. Uh, one on a turbo twin that I worked on a number of years ago, we made an extension for the turbos to deflect the exhaust downward also. And it cleaned up the wing real well. Uh, the wing was really dirty, 
from the, uh, the existing turbo exhaust. So we welded on a uh, stainless steel uh, deflector. Yeah, that, the, the, the turbo exhaust is very hard to make. I know I had mine made by Acorn up in Edmonton, uh, Albert, uh, Edmonton. It was a perfect fit, but I've heard from other people that you get multiple misfits because it fits very flush in the bottom of the wing. It's, and it does put exhaust on the bottom, but it's yeah. on that stainless steel plate. Correct. Uh, before I did the extenders, uh, there was a, quite a bit of buildup of junk, crunk, whatever, uh, on the, the ramp portion of the stainless steel uh, Knox View fairing. And I had to sand it off with 100 grit paper. And I noticed that that corrosion pitted the sloping portion of that fairing. And that's what drew me to make the uh, deflectors. And, that just, and you just welded on some, uh, uh, you know, an extend, and the extender was just welded on you stainless or did you use? Um, no. we, we took the, from the turbo, the, the stack from the turbo to the exhaust outlet is fairly short. We took it off there and uh, welded it up on a bench and then put a new gasket on and put the extension back on or the turbo uh, exhaust pipe back on. If you like, I'll send you a picture. Yeah, I'd like it because my, my turbo exhaust at the end is kind of like a spreader and made in the ink canal. And of course, ink canal, I'm, I think, you know, it's pretty difficult to weld, is it not? Well, my, uh, my friend uh, Travis Taylor he made up the extension or the deflector and welded it on. Yeah, please send me the drawing. I'd like to, I want to take a look at that. Okay, I'll send you a picture. Hans, when you come up with a, uh, a, a fix and or a uh, description of the problem, maybe we could uh, send out a paragraph or two to the, our email list so that everybody is aware of it and can, can check their own aircraft. I think so. Uh, this seems important. Like I say, I have, I have the Australian paper here. Yeah. And uh, it, I, it, I'm just thinking, rather than waiting for an AD, you know, be preemptive and send something out to the membership. Say, hey, take a look at this. Well, we don't want an AD. Right. I think we'll. I'm going to inspect my airplane Saturday, and uh, I, I'll I'll pass out what I find. And then what to look for? Uh, the gentleman from Alaska had the mechan well, the me he had the photos, and I have those on my cell phone. Uh, I can pass that along as well. But I'll I'll, I'll do a, a I'll do a, a good inspection. Terrific, right. terrific. Some of my own photos. Hans, how do you get access to that part of the spa? As far. Your what? To get access to the relevant portion of the spar, you have to what, take off the knots to you mod and then take off the underlying uh, stock no, no. screen? The, the area in question is one of the Australian people described it as panel number 12 or access panel number 12. I believe it's uh, slightly funny shaped uh, panel, what we use to get to the bungees. That's where it's leaking. And even on Delphi, it's been discussed a while back that that panel really needs to be sealed. And it's quite likely that some of that seal is no longer working. I'll, uh, like I say, I'll, let me give me a chance on Saturday, and then I'll uh, I'll write something up and pass it around. I'll probably put it on Delphi because that's where uh, you get a lot of action. <laughs> cool deal. And we are one minute away from seven thirty. Um, this is a this is a special Comanche Zoom because of the fact that Oshkosh and Sun and Thumb are canceled this year. Um, and Ron Kyle, our presenter, and his wife Betty Kyle can be seen at Oshkosh every year. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, so, and because Ron Kyle has done such exceptionally long distance flights with a stock 250 Comanche, it just kind of seemed appropriate tonight, kind of in honor of our missing air shows, to ask uh, Ron to speak on some of the, um, the techniques he uses for safe uh, long distance flying for airplane efficiency. And they cover the whole gamut of being a, a good and solid pilot. So um, I'm going to hand this over to Pete to introduce Ron at this point, uh, but I did just want to ask everybody who's sitting there to just uh, raise a glass to our missing air shows and our missing in-person fly-ins and gatherings. We will have them again. They are starting to happen again in the Northeast, but it's a special, special evening and a special week. Uh, Pete, you go ahead. Yeah, and as far as the introduction goes, I think it's already been done. What I will say though is for everyone, I'm going to mute everybody now, and uh, so that you know, you know, we won't have the interference in the back. Ron, you'll have to unmute yourself when you start talking. I would also suggest everyone that you go to the speaker view, so that when uh, Ron brings up his shared stuff, you, it'll be the full screen and you can see him and trying to see everybody all at once. Uh, this is all being recorded, so you can all come back and look at it some other time. So here we go. This is now I'm going to the speaker view, and Ron, you're on. Like an idiot, I'm looking for a button that says speaker view. Up in the upper left hand, upper yeah, upper upper, upper corner of the screen, there's a six dots, and there's a speaker view. Okay, Ron, have you unmuted? Okay, yeah, I just figured out how to do that. It changes you go. when you're you go to a different view. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about long distance flying that I've done in my PA 24 250. It's a 1961. And some of the things I'm going to talk about, I'm going to list some of my more notable flights, and I may even talk about some of the mistakes I made during those. And then I kind of divide uh, planning and the flying into three areas. There's, there's the airplane, there's you, the person, and then there's the, the flight planning, which includes the, the routing and the fuel and the weather and so on. So I, uh, I joined the ICS in 1986, which was the same year that I bought my PA-24-250. Uh, my ICS number was 7001. I did not renew a couple of years ago because uh, there was too much drama going on and I didn't need any more of that. So I, I thought I'd wait till things settled down before I get back into it. I, I believe in what the group was for. I, I believe we totally believe in a group that helps us keep our Comanches flying, make sure we fly them safe, and that uh, they continue on and on. I, I've had people ask me, how long do you think the Comanche will last? And then I, I say, well, look at the DC-3, which was, a lot of those were built in 1936 which was almost 15 years older than our plane. So, so when they scrap all the DC-3s, add at least 15 more years to that. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a commercial pilot uh, with multi-engine land, single engine C, I got tailwheel endor endorsement, I have an instrument rating, and most of this stuff except for the C plane, I got before 1990. Um, the seaplane I just did about three or four years ago, and I think I'm going to do a sailplane next year for my flight review. Um, I've got, I'm approaching close to 5,500 hours that I've put on my 61 Comanche. And uh, I'm trying to get my annual hours below 200 hours. I, I fly for the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and I do the Angel flights and Wings of Mercy and the 
a thing called a white feather flight and dreams and wings and a bunch of you know anything I can volunteer for. It it doesn't take much to twist my arm to get me to fly. Uh, so this presentation is going to be based on my personal experience and ob observations, and it's not necessarily real technical, but uh, it is based on what I've seen and done since 1986 with my Piper Comanche. And on some of the factors I'm going to talk about, the equipment, including the, the equipment that you take with you in addition to the airplane, physiological issues, emergency equipment, aircraft systems that have to do with the long distance flying, backups, flight planning, weather, uh, what I call electronic co-pilot, and then actually flying the trip. And then uh, safety, definitely fuel margins and weather are key safety items. Um, list of some of my notable flights. The, uh, the first three are flights that we do two or three times a year. So I'd say, uh, those three, 75% of the time, I can make them nonstop. Uh, the other 25% of the time, it's usually because of winds. Uh, it doesn't look like I'm gonna have enough fuel at, at the destination, so we stop at a midway point and get fuel. The trip to Denver, we've done two or three times. Uh, I think all of those have been nonstop. The trip to Westlaco, Texas, I've only done once nonstop, many times with a stop in uh, Arkansas. Uh, Santa Fe, we've done twice, and both of those were nonstop. The trip from Vegas to Dayton, Ohio, and I, I've been to Vegas many times in Palm Springs, but from Vegas to Dayton, Ohio is a farthest I've gone nonstop, but it wasn't the longest trip. It was just, I mean, the longest time-wise. Um, and then the St. Croix Virgin Island to Fort Lauderdale was the longest time-wise, uh, but it wasn't the longest distance-wise. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the trip to Westlaco, Texas. My uh, my father, this was back in 2003, had a stroke. And uh, I got a call while I was at work and I left work, drove to the airport. I did not have any approach plates or anything for Texas. So I, I borrowed some from a guy that, and all he had was Westlaco, which is where I wanted to go. And I took off. Uh, as I'm flying over Corpus Christi, I'm calculating my fuel, and it looks like I'm going to have an hour of fuel when I get to Westlaco, and the weather was 3,200 overcast. So, okay, I don't need to stop here for fuel. I'm going to have an hour when I get there, 3,200 feet. I'll just do a visual approach into the air airport, and I'd been there many times, and I'll be just fine. Well, I get down there and I shoot the approach for the VOR and I go missed. Now, Harlingen wasn't very far and McAllen wasn't very far, but I didn't have plates for them. But I did have a GPS approach plate for Westlaco, which was a little, 100 foot lower than the, uh, than the approach I just shot. So, I went back around and started that approach. Now, I used up 15 minutes for the approach, another 15 minutes for the mist, and I'm starting on the next approach, and I'm 15 minutes into that, and I'm looking at my calculation and I say, hey, you've only got 15 minutes left. That, that hour you thought you had when you got here, it's all gone, and you haven't landed yet. So as I'm coming, and it's at night, of course, 
And as I'm coming in on the approach, uh, okay, you're gonna have to either land at the airport or try to find the Rio Grande or, or the uh, intercoastal by Padre Island because you're not gonna be, have enough fuel to go do another approach anywhere. Well, luckily I saw the strobe and I was able to follow it in and, and make the landing there. And uh, I, I'd used all but about five gallons of my fuel. So from that day on, on a IFR trip, I've decided I want two hours at my destination. So now my, my planning all is to be able to fly to the destination or destination and alternate and have two hours remaining. Personal factors. Uh, because our planes have a wing that likes to fly high and because normally you get more efficiency at the higher altitudes, especially if there's, there's a little wind at the lower altitudes, it's gonna be better at the higher altitudes. So I use, I take supplemental oxygen with me on you know, every long distance flight. I have built into the plane, and I'll show you a picture later of my panel, a oximeter, that uh, it's a pulse oximeter. It tells you your heart rate and your percent oxygen. And anytime the plane is over 8,000 feet, it beeps at me every 15 minutes and says, check your oxygen. And if you don't check it, it keeps beeping. So if you wanna shut the beeping out, you have to check your oxygen. Now, I've also found when I don't have oxygen on, uh, if I'm just sitting there in the plane, and normally uh, you know, on a long flight, we sit there and we kind of slump over. I found that if I sit straight and put my shoulders back, I can raise my oxygen level three or 4%. It doesn't last very long, but I'll do that before I brief myself for approach and just before I do the approach unless I have the oxygen, then the oxygen takes care of that. Uh, it's important to stay hydrated. And that brings up another problem, but still it's, it's very important to stay, stay hydrated. Uh, especially when you're above the clouds where the sun's shining, you're evaporating moisture out of you at a very quick rate. And if the uh, pressure is a little lower up there, it seems to be leaving you even quicker. So. Take plenty of water or fruit with uh, water in it, you know, peaches and pears and some of those things are good also. And then uh, the range extender. Uh, I have tried all kinds of pea bottles over the years. I probably bought everything that Sporty sold and they're junk. Anything that's plastic, if you go up high and down and you know you, you change altitudes, and I'm talking about going up to 14, 15, 16, 17,000 feet and back down again, most of those plastic caps will start to leak. Uh, so the only thing that works is a glass jar with a good seal and a screw on cap, like a canning jar, um, Betty, what's, what's the jars we use? You don't remember? <laughs> anyway, we, we, uh, we like the uh, Classico spaghetti sauce. And uh, Classico spaghetti sauce quart jar is actually a canning jar with a sealed lid. And you can add spaghetti before you use it. So that works good for us. Um, I usually take energy bars. My wife likes saltine crackers. She'll, uh, she'll drink uh, water before we go and then she'll eat the crackers, which kind of absorbs the uh, water and actually can, causes you to, uh, to store water, but it solves the problem of having to 
P before you get to, to the destination. Uh, beef jerky and fruit is good for uh, something to, to go along with the water. I try to block the ultraviolet rays. My, my plane has the original curtains that came with it, which are pretty good. And uh, I used to put a map up in front, use the visors to hold it down. But uh, we now have these uh, rosin uh, filters that you can, uh, they got little suction cups and you can put them on the windows. Yeah, Washkosh used to sell them fairly inexpensive, but now they're getting real expensive. Um, and then some other things is just uh, keep alert, play what ifs. You know, what if my engine quits? Uh, what if my alternator quits? What if my vacuum pump quits? Uh, and have an answer for what you're going to do with each of those things all during the flight. Uh, monitor engine and fuel and track progress. And if, if you're making the planned fuel burn, uh, you'll probably make the trip okay. If uh, it looks like you're burning a little more, then you know, you've got a couple hours to decide where do you want to stop for fuel. Uh, you can use seat cushions or pillows or anything uh, if you need it for comfort. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll play music over the intercom a as a background. Uh, we still have an old uh, 496 in the plane that uh, it gives me a backup uh, GPS, but it also uh, has uh, what used to be XM uh, radio, now it's Sirius radio. The other thing is fly in smooth air whenever possible. Uh, I will compromise speed and even a fuel stop uh, on a long trip to have the comfort of, of smooth air. It's, it's a lot easier on me so that when I get done with the trip, I, I'm not as tired, but it's also easier on the plane. And I, I was telling CJ about one trip when we, we went down to Waco, Texas, and we were ahead of a tornado that was coming across Texas. And we were at least 200, 250 miles ahead of it. And we're going into Waco and it wasn't bad up at, I think I went down there at 14,000 feet. But as I'm coming down, when I get down below five or 6,000, we just get hammered. And even at maneuvering speed, we're getting hammered. And of course, at some point I've got to put the gear down and slow down and come in and land. When I got on the ground, I noticed that the, rod that holds the nose gear door had pulled right out and I contracted with the FBO there to put a scab patch on and fix that and while I was checking the plane over my exhaust manifold was cracked on the right side so I had to call Webco and have them send me a new right side exhaust manifold so that's why you want to fly where it's smooth air, because uh, the, the, the Comanche is tough, but uh, there are things that bounce around on it that uh, aren't as tough as the rest of the plane. Uh, in the summer, the higher altitudes give you the cooler air, which is more comfortable. And then, of course, continuously monitor your oxygen and the oxygen level of, of your passengers. And I usually try to give passengers things to do, uh, either looking at maps on their iPads or watching for traffic or pointing out cities and other things for me. Some survival and emergency equipment. Um, I'm from Michigan and uh, if you're from Michigan, almost anywhere you fly, you're gonna fly over one of the Great Lakes. And I don't care if it's the middle of July or August, uh, 
you're flying over Lake Superior or part of Lake Huron or Lake Michigan, and you've got a ditch, uh, if you don't get out of the water, you're gonna die of hypoxia. So when you're flying over these areas, besides a life jacket, take a life raft. The life raft will get you out of the water and save your life. Uh, extra water and energy food and a first aid kit. And we have a, a very large, uh, well, it's like a thermos, but it's, it's probably a foot and a half high and almost 18, 20 inches in diameter. And we put all the basic survival stuff in there, including a two-way radio and, of course, food and water and, and first aid kit and those kinds of things. Uh, I always carry a basic tool kit with me with probably too many tools, even a soldering iron and, and wire and wrenches and hardware and screwdrivers and so on. Uh, it's nice to be able to make a, a small repair and, and something simple like a push to talk switch for your, your uh, radio. It's nice to be able to repair that rather than wait to get it into a shop or pay somebody for it. Uh, blankets, suntan lotion, flashlights, uh, emergency signaling uh, device and uh, other signaling devices and a handheld NAVCOM. Talk about aircraft factors. Uh, know exactly how much fuel you have in each tank. And the only way I know of doing that is to empty the tank and then fill it up and see how much it takes to go all the way up to the top. Hopefully you'll get at least 15 gallons in the, uh, if you have the 90 gallons like I do, in the two smaller tanks and 30 gallons in each of the larger tanks. Uh, I can get a little bit more than that in mind and I don't know if, if I, it's, you know, I've got a, um, got four Eagle bladders in that replaced the originals a few years ago. And the, the originals that were in there, they held just a little hair less than 90 gallons. These hold 94 gallons, all four of them together. So, but the point is, know how much you have in each tank. And then when you're flying, know what your fuel burn is and what your true airspeed is for each setting of your manifold pressure and RPM. What you're looking for is really mile per gallon. Uh, I have a fuel computer that's wired to my 430. Uh, I also have electronic international engine analyzer and electronic international fuel computer, and that's the one wired to the 430. Uh, in addition to the oximeter, I have a CO detector that's also built into the panel, and it's a combined display for the two. And I would, I would recommend anybody with a single engine airplane have a CO detector, especially the ones with a single exhaust where you got the muffler sitting right on the firewall with a muffler around it for your your uh, cabin heat. Uh, just a pinhole leak in that muffler can put carbon monoxide into the cabin and unless you have a detector you're not going to know about it. The nice thing about this Guardian avionics detector is it's always there. I think every seven years it's got to be uh, recalibrated and, and I think they replace a, a transducer in it. Uh, but it's well worth the money. Uh, an autopilot with uh, GPS steering is a nice workload reliever in bad weather. And uh, ADSB in and out uh, is 
good for situation awareness. And I also have the Flight Stream 210 with Garmin Connects. So my uh, ADSP can talk to my iPad running a four flight. I can also put a route information into the iPad and send it to the panel. Or if I've already got some a route in the panel, it'll send that to four flight. So that's another really workload uh, reliever, especially if you've you've got to make a change to a route or an approach or departure or arrival procedure. And if you have the GTNs, uh, the flight stream 510 doesn't require any installation. It's just a data card. The, the whole thing is built on a data card. So you buy the 510 and you plug it in and you've got this connects capability. And each of these flight streams also have built in AHARS. So if you lost your vacuum or whatever you're using, you know, you lose the gyro, either the uh, attitude indicator or DG, there's an AHARS built into these flight streams. So it, it gives you a little backup. Flight planning, I used to use a lot of different uh, flight pan tools. In fact, before GPS and ForeFlight and all that, I, I did most of it manually. Uh, but then now I pretty much use the flightplan.com and ForeFlight, and probably 90% ForeFlight and 10% flightplan.com. And it gives me, I, I can put in my route. And when I do a route, I usually add a few VORs in the route. Um, when I first started flying with GPS, there were outages. Uh, I haven't experienced too many lately, although I, I did down on the east coast of Florida a few couple years ago. And I found out that was the military did that. Uh, but I put some VORs in the route. You know, I draw the straight line from point A to point B, put the VORs in the route, and then track them with my VOR, my number two radio. So if something happened to the GPS system or something happened to my 430, I can continue the flight. And at least, and I know where I am. Uh, in the planning, I plan a potential fuel stop midway, and I look for one that has the best fuel prices and quick in and out, which means not a towered airport, but uh, a lot of time a, a regional airport has good approaches, good service, and you don't get slowed down getting in and out. Uh, I download all the charts and weather briefs I need for the flight. And if you have four flight, there is a, a button you can push that uh, allows you to download everything required for that flight. The other thing I do is if it's an airport I haven't been to, or it's been a while since I've been there, I will fly the approaches and the arrival procedure with the simulator the night before the flight, just so that when I'm doing the flight and all of a sudden something, you know, the, the ATC will change the arrival or it'll change the, uh, the approach. When he says something, it makes a little sense to me because I remember from the night before flying and, and looking at each of those waypoints on the approaches and the procedures. Uh, I always, when I do my briefing for an approach, I, I brief for the mist. So a normal, the normal approach would be the approach and mist. And then uh, if the approach ends up with the ability to land, that's great. If it doesn't, I'm all ready for the mist. I've briefed it, I've programmed it in, and I'm ready to go and I'm not having to 
do a lot of rushing around trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. Uh, again, for any of my flights, I want two hours fuel when I land and for IFR and at least one hour for VFR, but I very rarely fly VFR, so two hours is my number. I use four flight. I fill all tanks to the absolute top with the plane level. And you got to pull the nose down quite a bit to get the plane level. Um, with four flight, in, in, and I'm not going to say too much about four flight, and some of you may know more about it than I do, but I've, I've been using it since it came out. And I try to keep up with the, the latest revisions and changes and features that they add to it. And that's sometimes tough. I go through all their videos, but uh, I configure my airplane in four flight. I configure the weight and balance. Uh, part of configuring it is figuring out the ICAO settings for your aircraft. You know, the, uh, the old non ICAO uh, IFR, all you had to do is, you know, you're a PA 24 slash golf. Well, now, You've got the ICAO equipment, you've got the ICAO surveillance, you've got the ICAO weight category, and then the uh, performance-based navigation ICAO. So you have to know, so these are the letters that you put in. If you have a WASP GPS and an AFCOM, uh, if you have a UAT in and out for ADSB, you would use NA mode C transponder, you'd use C and U2. If you have a, a GTX 345 or one of the other transponders that has ADSB in and out, uh, that would be a B2. Most likely that transponder is extended square, so that would be E it's because they're they're work together. Our planes, the uh, weight category is L for light. And then the, if you have a WASP GPS, your performance-based navigation is B2, C2, and D2. I uh, I input a route into the map view of for flight using the, uh, the flight plan button. And uh, I pick the aircraft, the performance, and the performance is something you can go in and edit. So depending on, you know, is this, is this gonna be a long flight? Um, is this gonna be a, uh, you know, do I have the wind, a tailwind? Uh, and I'm gonna go up uh, at a higher altitude, or do I have a headwind, so I'm gonna fly at a lower altitude at a, more of a power, you know, higher power setting. You, know, you decide all that as you're doing your what ifs for your planning your trip. Then you you can pick the performance. You know, am I going to burn 10 gallons an hour and and uh, and run 150, 155 knots, or am I going to burn 14 gallons an hour and run 162 or 165 knots true airspeed? Um, and that's going to be depend on you know what altitude I'm flying at and whether I have a tailwind or headwind. Um, so I put that in, I put in the altitude, I put in the time of departure, and then I let it decide, tell me how long it's going to take and how much fuel I'm going to burn. And then I may change a few things. I may change the altitude and speed a couple of times till I get what I want. You know, am I am I on a time schedule or am I not on a time schedule? Do I want to save fuel or do I want to make it nonstop? Do I, how fast do I want to get there? All all those become what ifs that you can let for flight take care of for you. And then you pack for the flight, and that's the button you push to 
even if it's not something you normally download into ForeFlight, it will pack all the maps and all the airport information and everything you need for that particular flight. Then I go to the flights page, I get the briefing, I check the imagery, and I may show you some of that if we have time. Uh, from the imagery, it has all the weather products that you need if you want to use them. But definitely, I want to know departure, en route, and destination weather for my times of flight in an hour before and an hour after each of those. Now, some of this stuff you may check two or three days in advance, especially if there's some big weather systems coming through. Uh, familiarize yourself with the destination airport. You can check the weather. You can read the discussion, which is about the same thing that if you called flight service, that they would read to you. Check runways and winds, and floor flight even tells you, here's the best runway to use based on the winds at that time. Uh, load procedures into plates. Uh, you don't want to have to sit there on an approach or even on an arrival and have to go try and find that information for that airport. So I set up a, in, in plates, I set up for each airport and I load everything I need for that airport. So like if I'm gonna go into uh, you know, Delta 95, I would have, and they don't have a rival procedure, but I've had, I'd have three approaches in there. If I'm going into Detroit, I'd have DTW and I'd put arrival and departure procedures and all the approaches uh, in there and any other information. Uh, there are a number of other sources and everybody has their, uh, their favorites. Uh, ADDS I used to use a lot, Storm, Scoot uh, chart, uh, there's Wind Map and Windy and, and lots of others. So, you know, whatever your favorite weather sources are, uh, that's, that's what you should use. And I, I, use, I would recommend you know, even use more than one. I even use a thing called weather bug that is real simple, but uh, it, it gives me seven days out and I can kind of see what, what's going to go on in the next five to seven days. Again, I'm mentioning again about using the simulator and then, whoops, make your go no go decision. Have predetermined minimums and stick to them. Uh, like, I won't fly anywhere near a thunderstorm that's spitting out uh, those round icy things. And I also, uh, if uh, you got freezing rain and freezing temperature is from the ground up, I won't fly in that area. Uh, I will fly through a mild thunderstorm. My, my minimum is uh, 20,000 feet or less and less, moving less than 20 mile an hour. If it's over in that, I'm gonna go around it. And if you go around it, that means try to go around the backside if you can, because the front side, even if you're 100 or 200 miles away, as I found out, it can still bite you. Uh, you can change the time of the flight, you can change the route of the flight, you can cancel. But make sure you have rules of how you're gonna fly, what you're comfortable flying in, and stick to those rules. Some of the highlights of the uh, planning, uh, define the route using the maps view and uh, if you're in four flight, you can use Victor Airways, you can use T routes, you can uh, put, go point to point. You can look at a, um, a profile to see uh, 
you know, is there anything at this altitude, am I gonna run into anything or do I need to go higher or can I go lower because there isn't anything? Uh, load arrivals, departures, and approach charts into the directory called plates. Study weather data using imagery and forecast plus forecasted discussions. Uh, using stormflightplan.com or weatherbug, verify the weather with what you've seen with imagery and forecast and the forecast discussions. Modify the route if necessary, determine your fuel burn times and fuel stops if you have any, and then make your go-no-go -no -go decision. Uh, talk a little bit about flying the plane. Pre-flight, uh, you gotta check to make sure that uh, your fuel is full. And it's a good time to look underneath the wings and make sure you're not leaking fuel. If, if you see a tank that's leaking, then you might wanna burn that quick, you know, burn it first so that you're not gonna lose any fuel. Uh, do your weight and, weight and balance and, and the rest of your pre-flight. Uh, during a mag check, and I found this over a few years, um, I do a mag check both at 1,000 RPM while I'm taxi taxiing and then 2,000 RPM while I'm doing my run-up. I have found that uh, I've, I've had a mag that uh, would do great at 2,000 RPM, but it was putting out such a weak spark that uh, at 1,000 RPM, you get a, a you get a drop, an RPM drop, more than the, the 125 that we're, we'd like to see. Uh, and that usually meant that uh, either the, the coil was bad or, or, or something was wrong with the points, or even the condenser. Um, when I take off, I push the throttle, most of my flights are at the higher altitudes. I push my throttle all the way full and lock it. And I don't touch it till I get to my target altitude. In fact, most cases I don't touch it. It's full throttle and I just leave it there and climb up the altitude. And then uh, if I'm at a high altitude airport, like out west, Durango or a lot of those out there in Colorado and in that area. I will lean on the ground to make sure I get full power. At altitude, I set the power per the plan and I lean aggressively. And I, I think our, uh, our flight manual or the owner manual, it, it says to, uh, lean your your hottest cylinder to peak with the carburetor i i've never been able to go lean a peak i i will aim for peak and uh that's about the best i can get if i if i start to go lean a peak the engine will start to surge so what I do is I, I pull the mixture back until the engine starts running rough. I push it forward, and this is the mixture, till I get that first surge. And then I go for peak EGT on my hottest cylinder. And my EGTs run pretty close to each other. My, uh, my cylinder head temperatures, one and two will be the lowest, but they'll be equal. Three and four will be the next highest, but they're usually within five or 10 degrees of each other. And then five and six will be the highest, and they'll be within five or 10 degrees of each other. Uh, 345 degrees is normally when I get up to cruise and run for a while where they stay at. I've seen, I've never seen over 400. I've seen 395 on a climb out on a hot day down in Florida. But uh, as soon as I push over and start cruising, 
it goes back to 340, 350. Uh, if I'm going for a really long flight, and I, I may go down to 40% power, normally my long distance flights are 50, 55% power but uh, I may go a little lower than that, in which case I may bring the throttle back a little bit. Uh, but normally at the altitudes, you know, if you're flying 14, 15, 16,000, you're not making 75% power up there <laughs> with a carburetor. So uh, monitor the oxygen. Uh, and if I'm below 92%, I'll use the supplemental oxygen. I'll be monitoring fuel and, and I'll show you a little farther along here, uh, the nifty screen on my 430 that helps me with this. But uh, usually after I'm an hour or so on a four or five or six hour flight, I know if I'm gonna make it or not. I know if I'm gonna have to make a fuel stop. So I've got a couple hours to decide, okay, where do I wanna stop? What's the price of fuel? Number of these airports. That information is all in for flight and it's live while you're flying. Um, I burn fuel to balance the plane. So I've got somebody, if nobody's in the right seat, then it's a little bit heavier on the left side. If I've got somebody in the right seat that's heavier than me, then you know I may burn more fuel over there, but I'll I'll burn it until I don't so I can fly hands off and stay straight and level. And then I switch every 15 minutes until I run the auxiliary tanks dry. And normally I know based on my fuel burn, when they're gonna go dry. You know, am I burning eight gallons an hour, 10 gallons an hour, 12 gallons an hour, or 14 gallons an hour. And so, when I get close to that time, I start watching the uh, the fuel pressure, and you've got about a second or two when you see the fuel pressure start to move to switch tanks. Otherwise, the engine gets quiet. And if that does happen, pull the throttle back to just a little bit above idle, so that when you switch tanks and it kicks on again, you don't have a big surge. It's just going to start idle, and then you can slowly push the throttle forward again. But if you're keeping an eye on your burn and keep an eye on the fuel pressure, you shouldn't have to have the engine go quiet. Uh, with two tanks remaining, uh, I'll I'll switch every 15 minutes until I'm down to close to an hour in each tank, and then. If I know I'm gonna use a, a left-hand pattern, I'm gonna keep the right hand, I'll use the left tank and keep the right tank uh, full before I get ready to land. If I know I'm gonna do a right-hand pattern, I do the opposite. But uh, two things, I, I don't wanna have fuel in multiple tanks. When I get down close to you know this two hours, uh, I want to have at least an hour in each of the two main tanks. And if I burn part of that two hours, I want to have an hour in the tank that I'm going to land with. And the tank that's up in the air when you land is the one I want to have the fuel in because there's a chance of unporting the tank if, if you get low on fuel and you're you're making a bank to uh, to come in and, and do your turn from downwind to base or base to final. Uh, this is a picture of the panel. And uh, this is uh, at 13,000 burning 10 gallons an hour. You can see uh, my fuel computer and then to the right of that is that white thing, that's an oximeter that you stick your finger in. And to the right of that is the engine analyzer, but if you take a picture of that with your iPhone, 
it doesn't show the thing lit up all the way. And that's so obviously it's it's time slicing when it turns those uh, segments on and off. And then the below that is the output of the carbon monoxide detector and the oximeter. And then this is this is a screen that I wish they would put in the GTNs. The GNSs have this screen. And this tells me I'm burning 10 gallons an hour. I'm going to have 33.6 gallons at my destination. Uh, I have a 1,435 nautical mile range, uh, eight hours and 58 minutes endurance at that point. Uh, got 90 gallons of fuel on board. I need 56 to complete this trip. And uh, it's may at this point, it's making 16 nautical miles per gallon. So that's almost everything you need to know about fuel in one one place. Flying with ForeFlight, and I'm assuming most of you are familiar with ForeFlight. Probably some of you know it better than I do. Uh, I usually keep it uh, in a map view, and then I'll switch to the airport view to. And I keep in my favorites the airports that that I'm going to land at, you know, at least at least uh, the destination and the potential fuel stop. So as I'm flying, I can look at the airport view. I can look at information about that airport, what the weather is at that airport, uh, any notams for that airport, and that's all continuously updated. Uh, on the map view. I always click the TFR and radar buttons. So those are on all the time. Uh, the other things like the winds and the ceilings, the visibility, temperature, uh, icing, US icing, uh, I'll monitor as I needed. And most of those, you have a slider on the right side where you can, like icing, you can say, OK, what's the icing at 14,000 feet? And it'll show you. And you say, okay, I don't like that. How about if I go up to 16,000? Okay, that looks better. Or what if I go down to 8,000? So you can kind of play with that. And I found that to be very, very accurate. It, it does a good job. Uh, very rarely do I go through a thunderstorm, uh, go around it, but Try to go around the back side or the downwind side. Uh, in the winter, here in Michigan, you can almost always fly above weather unless for some reason you got a front that's bringing some cumulus clouds in. But usually you just have stratus in the winter. If you can't get above, you know, for some reason the, the, the clouds are going up above 18,000 or so, and there's no way you're going to get above it. There's almost always layers, so you can get in the layers. If you can't do that, you can fly around them. Uh, some information about flying through, uh, I'll say unstable weather, where you've got updrafts and downdrafts. When you get into a, an updraft, don't try to maintain altitude. You know, tell ATC, I got I'm in an updraft, unable to maintain altitude. Uh, he may ask you how high you're going to go. You might have an estimate, you might not. But the first thing I do if I've got a, an updraft is I will pull the throttle back. And then I'll pull up on the yoke, you know, pull the yoke back to try to slow the plane down. And if I have to, I may even put gear and flaps down. And then I just ride it up. It may take me up a thousand feet, it may take me up two or three thousand feet or more. Now the good news is you got more 
potential energy. So now you can slowly come back down and save some fuel. But if you try to, if you just momentarily try to maintain altitude and your plane is clean, that airspeed indicator will find V and E faster than you can imagine. And that's, that's what causes people to tear wings off of airplanes. They do it actually by exceeding V and E because they get into a situation where they're trying to control or their airport, their autopilot is trying to control an altitude and the wind, you know, the air is trying to take you up. So you're actually going down by trying to stay at the same altitude and you're picking up speed and you're picking up speed very quickly. So you know, it's, it's against what you would think you should do, but if you pull the throttle back, pull the yoke back, let whatever's going to happen happen. You're you're not going to tear your airplane up. Uh, and also use uh, distance rings. Uh, and there's a glide advisor and uh, you know, our Comanches clean with the prop control pulled all the way out. Uh, have a 13 to one glide ratio. And you, you can vary that 13 to one all the way down to one and one to one by doing a, uh, a forward slip with full flaps, prop control all the way forward, gear down, and of course at idle. So you've got a pretty good range. Arrival departure and approach procedures. Uh, use the, during the flight, uh, either by looking at weather or from listening to what other people are doing, I'll know what arrival procedure they're using and I'll load that. And I'll load that right into the route. And you can pick the transition. And usually you pick the one that is along your route. Uh, if you don't have one and you just have uh, an approach, you can monitor the weather or look at the airport view and see what the weather is and determine what's going to be the approach. And I add that approach to the route on the map page. So I've got that plate right in front of me on the route. And I will load it. And as soon as I've been approved for it, I'll activate it. And I always load the full approach even if they are going to give me vectors. Because if you load the full approach, you have all the waypoints. If you say vectors, it doesn't load all the waypoints. And they may send you to one of the initial fixes or some waypoint along the final approach course, and you don't see it on there because you didn't load it all. ADS-B in devices, uh, of course, everybody now that's flying IFR surely has ADS-B out. Uh, there's a lot of in devices. I definitely would recommend get in and out. Uh, I've had my GDL-88 for about six years now, and it's been interesting to watch, especially on on flights around the Bahamas to watch where I used to see one or two or three airplanes. And then the last few years, I'll see 40 or 50 airplanes. You know, it's, it's amazing to see a number of people that now have ADS-B that, that you're able to see. Uh, if you have a GNS or, or a uh, GTN, and I'm talking GTNs are the 650s and 750s, or the TXIs, the GNSs are like the 430 or 530. Uh, the Flight Stream 210 and Flight Stream 510 are really, really worth the money. And there's a few other options. That I, you know, I haven't kept up on the last couple of years, so I'm sure there's even more options than what I show here.
And I, I'm going to add another thing before I talk about conclusions. The uh, it's very important if, especially if you're doing a lot of long distance flying, and especially if you're doing it in the Michigan, where we get a lot of IFR days up here. Uh, practice partial panel as much as you can. I had a friend, or I have a friend, he's still okay. He uh, he flies a, uh, a Baron 58, and I fly it a lot of times for uh, Wings of Mercy flights. So I'm real familiar with his plane. And this is not his first Baron. In uh, snowy, stormy weather one day, he takes off for uh, Rochester, Minnesota. And I'm looking at the weather and I, and I said, John, if you're gonna go there, I suggest you fly south around this weather because I'm seeing tops at 30 and 40,000, which means clear ice. So I don't care what you got on your plane, you don't wanna go through clear ice. So stay away from that. And in fact, I told him, if I were flying patients, I wouldn't go. Well, he went anyway. He made it to Rochester. He picked up the patients. And he was going to fly to one of the airports, and I think it was Houghton, Michigan, but one of the one of the airports in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan. And as he's flying, he's checking the weather and decides to not to go there, but to go to it was Menominee which is also Michigan, but it's right, it's really Wisconsin. It's right on the west side of Lake Michigan. As he's coming down through the clouds and he's picking up some ice, his attitude indicator quits working. So now he's in a panic because he doesn't have an attitude indicator. So Instead of landing at Menominee, which has a big airport, big runway, nice ILS, he goes out over Lake Michigan and drops down lower, hoping to find a place where he's not going to pick up ice. And he's still picking some up. So he then goes up to 3,500 feet and he asks ATC to vector him to the nearest airport. So they call a county truck that's near that airport. The county truck makes one pass down the runway, and that's where he ends up going to land. Now his, his windshield is iced up, so you know he's slipping and trying to look out the side. And he comes into this airport that had one pass with a county truck, which means it's got a big bank on one side. His wing hits that bank and uh, throws the plane into a ditch and, and an abrupt stop and basically totals his, his airplane. Luckily, nobody got hurt. You know, the, the seat belts and shoulder harnesses held. But he totaled his airplane and he did it because he could not fly partial panel. All he had to do was fly without an attitude indicator. He had, he had a turn coordinator, he had GPS, you know, he had everything he needed to fly it, and he chose to panic and and not fly partial panel. So I strongly recommend learn how to fly partial panel. You will have a vacuum pump failure once in a while. You will have an attitude or a DG failure once in a while. You know, these things happen. It doesn't have to be a big deal, especially with now you got the stratus and flight streams and all these things that'll put an A-harsh right on your your iPad and it's a accelerometer generated A-harsh. It's not a GPS generated one. So it's as good as if you're looking at the instrument in front of you. Um, so anyway, just a suggestion. Uh, Detailed planning, cost of vigilance during the flight, monitor mile per gallon, weather, oxygen, and fuel remaining. Uh, if there's any question about whether you're gonna have, in my case, two hours when I land, if it looks like I'm only gonna have an hour and 50 minutes or an hour and 45 minutes, 
I make a stop. I'm not going to get in the position where I, I bet I have to land on this approach or I'm going down anyway. Um, I think that's the end of this. So I'm going to stop the this part of it. And I'll stop screen sharing. And I'm checking to see if there's any questions. And there are questions. <laughs> um, yeah. where so, do they where do they go? They're in the chat window. I'm going to go ahead and read them because we do have people attending via dial in. Okay. Um, if that's uh, good with everybody. And um, let's see. And then we've got enough time that uh, as soon as I've gone through these, I think. If it's okay with you, Ron, we'll just open it up and let people just jump in and ask. Sure. Yeah, as I, um, I tried to keep it to an hour, so I think I did that. You did good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're going to um, make sure that those who asked about the discussion prior, where Hans Newbert noted that there was a question regarding exhaust uh, venting into the twin wings, we will uh, pass up on those, but if you've got a twin Comanche, you might want to try to figure out how to look into that chat window for part of that discussion. Um, Pat Kiefer notes, putting plastic bottles into two Ziploc bags also works <laughs> regarding the, uh, uh, oh, the, yeah. the glass jars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it I'll does tell sound you, more I've, convenient. I've, I've done almost everything, and the uh, those Classico canning jars have been the best. And, and I... Yep. Uh, I wrap them in a plastic bag, you know, a gallon baggie, and I usually I got my blue my blue bag, and usually has four or five of those in there because I've I've flown with other people that need them. So. <laughs> <laughs> and when we're done, we just throw it all away. <laughs> we don't recycle. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a good thing. Um, Robert Klein just mentioned everybody traveljohn.com for disposable urinals. Yep. Um, Lonnie and Lauren asked, what oxygen saturation do you shoot for? Okay, um, I said that you should know your own uh, your, your signs and symptoms. I've been in a, uh, a ch barrel chamber twice uh, and taken up to 30,000 feet and then, you know, you, they give you tests every minute. And you know, in about five minutes, you're you're about done. But uh, so I I know what my symptom is. My symptom is a, uh, a a kink in my neck on the right side. That's my first symptom. Second symptom is uh, I start to get irritable, and I have troubles. And I I'm I'm electrical engineer, so I like math. I have troubles adding and subtracting a couple of numbers. So that's what I know. So what do I shoot for? 87 or above. I say I say 92 because that's what all the nurses and doctors will tell you. Um, and everybody's different and everybody has different symptoms. So for me, I want to be above 87. And I'll tell you, if I when I get down into the 80s and I put 88, 99 within, you know, maybe half a minute or less. I mean, it comes right up. Does anybody want to jump into this conversation um, with their own uh, SpO2 or oxygen saturation numbers before we move on? Because this is a really critical point. It takes hours to days once you get hypoxic, once you get um, if there's any CO2 in there for that to uh, to go away. So does anybody want to just jump in? My instrument reading, um, my instructor took me and another student up to 18,000 feet. He was flying and he had the uh, oxygen on board because he wanted us to, with, with a pulse ox, so that we would learn what happens to us at 18,000 feet. So I happen to know that um, I start to get a little funny around that 92%, but I also retain high oxygen saturation levels without oxygen very high 
Anybody else want to jump in with their own symptoms and what they aim for? Yeah, Mark Sullivan here. I've had a lot of experience with this. Um, I smoked very heavily for many decades, quit 20 years ago. But yeah, I can anecdotally, back when I smoked, back in the night, you know, stopped in like 1999, I light up a cigarette at uh, 10,000 feet over LA. And all of a sudden, all the orange, yellow traffic, you know, uh, street lights, I'd see them, they'd fade, you know, they'd fade out to white. And as a doctor subsequently explained to me that, you know, the, one of the first signs of hypoxia is that the, uh, the, the cones in your eye fail, begin failing to process color. Um, mm. After that, I very early on paid a lot of money for it. I mean, back in like 19 something, I bought a pulse oximeter. They used to cost like $500. Now they're like 19, yeah. but I've used it for years. <clears throat> and um, I always felt great flying, but I discovered when I was 50, I discovered that at like 11,000 feet, I'd be getting readings of 88 and sometimes as low as 84. And as I've gotten older, the number's gotten worse. Well, having smoked many years, uh, I volunteered for a national lung study trial at UCLA, which was unbelievably comprehensive on uh, uh, whole issues of uh, oxy you know, oxygenation and uh, effect of having been a smoker or industrial uh, exposure and the like. And having dealt with some absolutely awesome pulmonologists and researchers, I mean, they've got me where I religiously use a supplementary oxygen, you know, above about 10,000 feet. Now, what I've discovered to be the, the, the really a, a jewel is you find yourself a used uh, oxygen concentrator. They're new. They're very expensive. They're three, four thousand dollars You can get them used for like $1,500. You plug it into your cigarette lighter. It puts out forever, you know, two to three liters of oxygen and keeps me t uh, constantly at 94. I don't have to worry about the tanks. I've got that bad boy as long as I got electrical energy and then the battery that's built into it will go three hours in any event. I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, but in my experience now that I'm, you know, of retirement age that, um, you know, above really uh, above 8,500 feet, if I'm not using oxygen, I can see that same effect when I used to smoke. That the lights will turn white looking at the ground and for sure sign that, you know, you don't have enough oxygen uh, for your brain to be fully functioning. So that's a good quick test. If you don't know how sensitive you are, go up one night in an area with city street lights, look for the yellow, you know, the, the, that salmon orangey light and see how high you get before they start looking white. And that tells you right away you've hit a critical level. That's a great tip. Good, go ahead, good Ron. point, good tip. Yep. And Mark, what was that thing you said? It was an oxygen concentrator that you can plug yeah. in? Yeah. People that have COPD, you know, a lot of people that have uh, um, COPD or other oxygen problems, they, instead of carrying around tanks, they use oxygen concentrators. And the device is basically, it's got a sieve in it that sorts the oxygen out of air. And they can, depending on the brand, they can put out up to four liters a minute. Hmm. Now. Um, some of it's pulse, you know, pulse action up to four. It's plenty adequate for anybody that's healthy enough to be flying an airplane. You know, two liters I find is fine. They weigh the, the, the new ones, which are quite expensive. We're talking three, four thousand dollars, weigh about seven pounds. The older, more vintage ones weigh 18 pounds. They're certified by the FAA, by the way. I asked the FAA, they said, well, that's certified as a passenger. I said, how about if you're crewman? And they're like, the reg doesn't say. So if it says certified by the FAA and your readings are coming in good, you're probably good to go. Now, I've never asked aeromedical in Oklahoma because I've learned from experience, no matter what the question is, you know, is today Thursday? The answer is always no. So <laughs> I'll go on what the FISDO guy told me. Yeah, that was very cool. Very good, very good. Um, the, you know, you CJ, you're talking about it lasting. Um, 
the last time I was in the, the barrel chamber, uh, I started getting a headache, like, like when you have a really bad cold, and that lasted the rest of the day. I mean, I just felt like crap. And it's not, you know, as soon as you put the oxygen on, everybody says, well, you know, everything goes away and you get better. No, I didn't get better. I felt like crap the whole rest of the day. You know, part of the problem you got to remember too, is that altitude we're dealing, it's always with a partial pressure issue. If you have any carbon monoxide leak, even one that would be absolutely innocuous at low altitude, as you go up and the mix of oxygen goes down, the, if you have a constant level of CO, it becomes more pronounced, obviously, because there's less to dilute it. And a very small amount of CO, once you breathe it in, of course, the, your blood holds CO for an extended period of time. It takes, I think, 24 hours to get CO out of your blood. And that's a surefire headache. Um, I can relate to it. Back in the 60s, I had a, uh, um, a Corvair. Love that car, no matter what Ralph Nader says. <laughs> and I flew that. I drove that. Yeah, I flew it. I really flew it. Drove it across Canada, going back home to Michigan. And I got a, uh, an exhaust leak and didn't know I had an exhaust leak. I, after driving many, many hours, I got into Michigan, stepped out of the car, and passed out in a snowbank in Lapeer, Michigan. My fingernails were all blue, et cetera. Um, and what it was, just a gradual buildup of the CO. You had, don't realize you have it at all. And then I had the mother of all headaches for three days. I was actually lucky to survive through it. Yeah, um, it's a good point. And actually, just a quick anecdote. Um, the two airplanes that I know of where the pilots passed out due to carbon monoxide leaks in the case one where were a Comanche and a Mooney. And the the reason that we know those stories is because those two airplanes, for whatever reason, managed to run out of fuel and land themselves in fields in such a way that the pilot survived. Um, I won't go into those right now, but I'm actually trying to track down the pilot of that Comanche to see if he'd be willing to come and talk to us about his experience surviving a CO uh, leak that led him to um, to pass out and survive this. It was a 400, by the way, for those that are curious. Uh, if you've got other... Comanche in the same club as the F-107. I think it's the only other airplane that's done that. Oh, my Lord. I had no yeah. idea. One of the um, famous F-107, guy passed out and the plane landed in a snow field. I think it was in Idaho or someplace. And <laughs> ran for like 20 minutes. No damage to the plane. That's incredible. Yeah. If one, anybody one else anecdote. has... Go ahead. I have one anecdote. Uh, we were flying, of course, we were flying in the 210 at that, that, that time with the wife in the back and the son flying and I'm uh, in the right seat. And the wife always uh, says over, over the intercom, how come everything is white in front? Well, I said, there's clouds out there. And by that, and then my son just looked back and she was out already. And we went, and then we were at 14,000 feet and uh, it didn't take long. We were down and she uh, came back, but that was a scary, scary moment. Wow, that's a good story to, to know about. Thanks, Glenn. And remember, if your dog is with you, that they get hypoxic before you do. And I rigged up a little gizmo to take a, like a cannula, a tube for a cannula, and just Velcro it onto mutt muffs. Um, <laughs> you no, know, you got to remember if you get if you got your pup with you, they need oxygen. <laughs> Eric Jones, I hope you're listening. <laughs> yeah, it's good I'd like to make a comment. Yes, okay. please. Yeah, uh, in my introduction of myself, you may recall I mentioned I was an ex Air Force flight surgeon. If you have a chance to go into a barrel chamber, absolutely do that because everybody's hypoxic symptoms are different. A lot of them are very common. But the chance of you having the same one as was described in an anecdote of the lights turning white. That does happen, but not to everyone. If you have a chance, go into a barrel chamber and find out what are your symptoms. Yeah, that's that's really a good point. I, I've been in a barrel chamber twice over the last 10 years, and I can tell you it changes as you get older too. That, that one trip that I showed from Las Vegas to Dayton, Ohio, 
was about mm. seven and a half hours at 14,000 feet with no oxygen. And that was 20 years ago. And I was starting to get irritated and I was having troubles calculating my fuel when I got near Indianapolis. And I hadn't been in a barrel chamber before that, but I also had this kink in my neck. Well, after I went through the barrel chamber, I found out, okay, you had all, all the symptoms from the beginning to, to the headache during that flight. I never got the headache on that flight, but I had all the other symptoms for me. So now I know if I get that crook in my neck, I'm still, I, I still see okay. I think I can think okay, but that's my clue right there. That, hey, stick your finger in there and check to see what you are or get down lower. Uh, and luckily, as I have the CO detector in the plane too, and it shows if there's any CO at all. And um, I, I think that's a must for our, our single engine airplanes. The twins, not so bad, but definitely a single engine. Mm. Although I guess I the just, twins could have a problem with their, their heater. <laughs> yeah. And Robert said a headache is a 911 call for oxygen for him, any kind of a headache. Um, one thing I, I learned in reading about hypoxia and carbon monoxide poisoning um, the, uh, is, well, two things. One, if your control rod boots, so if you look under, um, in, if you, when you do your pre-flight check, there are two rubber boots that are um, covering the control rods, the, the push rods, right, um, that, are, that are coming through the firewall. Yep. If those boots get a tear, or if you look at them, they're screwed onto the firewall and then they, um, they have a metal, just basically a, a hose clamp that clamps them onto the uh, control rods and the, they're usually white, the, the rods. If that clamp is off, if those boots have a tear, those boots, one of their jobs is to keep um, exhaust gases from the, the cabin. And so I never knew this until this year when I had a torn control rod and uh, both Zach Cran and George Richmond independently happened to look in there and say, you have a, you have a torn uh, boot and that is going to, you know, you need to be careful of that because during the summer when you're, you're doing fresh air, maybe you're okay, but you know, this, that's keeping bad stuff out of your cabin. So make sure your exhaust doesn't have any leaks and get that fixed. So it's now fixed. And do you know, it was you, one, know you can, there's a, there's a service letter from Piper that allows you to put those boots also on the inside. I did see that. Webco sent it to me. Yeah. Yeah. And so I have them on the outside and inside. Uh, because besides the, uh, the carbon monoxide issue, cold air comes through there in the wintertime and hot air comes through there in the summertime. <laughs> so it, it makes the cabin more comfortable if you have a, a good seal on those too. Oh, that's uh, a great tip. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> Steve, yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Go ahead. Okay, I can't hear myself. So um, I had a, two or three things to comment on. Maybe Dr. Wolf can uh, see what he thinks about it. But as far as CO2 goes, a, a healthy person should not be getting CO2 narcosis. The only way that would happen is if, if they were stopping breathing. You know, like perhaps a pilot in a jet who doesn't know the oxygen is off and you see him, you know, they'll become, they'll become apneic, but a normal person isn't going to build up CO2. It is correct that it takes a long time for the CO2 to wash out, but O2 immediately goes back up to a normal level. So whatever symptoms are remaining could just be a, you know, a function of vasospasm or some other thing. I don't doubt that they remain. You know, you should be aware. But I think the best method is to just use oxygen when it's required. And if you know from doing your own pulse ox that you need oxygen at 11,000 feet, then you should use it at 11,000 feet. And I would never let my pulse ox go down to 87 while flying. I just wouldn't. Um, and mm -hmm. 
it could be your pulse ox is not correct. You know, that's possible. But at 87, you should be noticing that something's not, I know Ron, he's, he should be noticing that something's not right. Um, and mm -hmm. carbon monoxide, most people will not know that, that they're having that effect. So that's why you need a carbon monoxide monitor. And the, uh, the last thing I wanted to say, I thought it was interesting what Mark said about the concentrator, but I'm, it sounds like it works for him, but it's kind of odd that it will concentrate oxygen at an altitude where oxygen is quite thin, if you catch they, my drift. Yeah, they, no, they work up to about 15,000 feet. There's a okay. limit on it. But they do, and I was referring to, you know, uh, by the way, carbon dioxide accumulating, CO. That CO, once you ingest that, that takes, it bonds to the hemoglobin and you can't get rid of it. Right, right. carbon monoxide. So you can, but it yeah. takes time. Carbon and monoxide, Gomer's an MD, everyone, the, so he's, he knows what he's talking monoxide, about. Carbon monoxide is the one you don't want binding to your, to your hemoglobin, right, Dr. Wolf, because it's, dipl it's displacing oxygen. Yeah, that's, it becomes carboxy hemoglobin. And it uh, takes a very long time to uh, to uh, pass that through the system. By the way, every now and then I hear people confusing CO two and CO. Be very careful with that. Right. Yep. Yeah, DJ, and it is the CO that's close. Go ahead. DJ, it looks like there's a couple other questions here. Absolutely. One, I think one one from Gomer it says, yes. uh, do, "Do you reduce prop RPMs in climb after reaching 400 feet?" pattern height or leave the prop alone until at cruise altitude. Uh, I leave it uh, alone until I get to cruise altitude. I don't go back to 2500 RPM either. I, it's, it's a 2575, I just leave it there until I get to cruise. And then, then I start adjusting it. And then what I adjust it to is dependent on uh, what kind of mileage do I want to get? Because the lower, the lower the RPM, the better mile per gallon I get. But there's points that the plane doesn't feel right, so I go, I go to where it feels like it's running comfortably, and that's mm -hmm. uh, that's very subjective. But uh, you know, my my plane is happy at certain places, and I try to fly it there. And then mm -hmm. the next the next questionnaire says, GN, GTNs do have the fuel page. Yes, they do, but they don't interface it, unless it's something brand new, they don't interface it to the fuel computers. You have to put the data in uh, yourself. And if, if I'm wrong, Craig, uh, if there's something new there, let me know, but... Uh, as far as I know, it uh, it doesn't tie into the fuel computer. Yeah, I'd like mm -hmm. to endorse by the your comment on hydration. This is anecdotal, but uh, on the way back from Oshkosh in 2013, um, nobody flew back with me, so I filled the airplane up all 120 gallons, took it up way high, and I had like two bottles, 12 ounce bottles of water, and flew nonstop like to, to Utah or someplace, and then did it again to, to uh, Southern Nevada and then to California. Got out of the airplane, didn't feel well. The next day, I was in the hospital with acute kidney failure. Stayed there for 13 days and oh. recovered, recovered, but did some permanent damage to my kidneys. And boy, since then I've learned, of course you go to altitude and the dehydration is even much worse than it would be at sea level and you'll mm. literally hurt yourself and you don't even know it. Um, so now I drink like a fish, water, <laughs> fly. <laughs> I, I wanted to add another comment about uh, long, long range flying, which sounds terrifically appealing, but we're getting into uh, older age and deep vein thrombosis is no joke. Yeah. So there's a downside risk to staying in that plane for more than two or three hours at a time without getting out and walking around. Mm. Very good point. Um, and Doc, wasn't it true that if dehydration increases the likelihood of getting a DVT? 
I'm sure I've heard that. Okay. Sure. Yep. And we do have several physicians here. Gomer, who was speaking earlier, is an MD uh, along with Emmanuel. So these are pilots that are uh, that are very, very familiar with our human system. So it's really great advice that they're giving. Um, just uh, one quick thing. We're, we're reaching 9 p.m. Uh, so I'm going to just read a couple of comments that, that people put in on how to get max fuel in the bladders because uh, it's we, we sponsored a, a couple of things and we discovered that Comanches are actually tricky to get really, really full in those bladders. So just wanted to pass on a couple of helpful hints. Um, David um, mentioned that for max fuel in his bladders, he uses a PVC pole at about as high a tail position as he can get it when he's fueling. He said, I'm, it's not near level for the book, but it makes a big difference and he keeps it in the back of the plane. David, do you want to add anything to that as far as how you wedge it on behind the plane without hurting your paint? Uh. It's Daniel, but that's close enough. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, Daniel. I, I, I'm i reading on my iPhone and you're texting. Oh, sorry. Now. My apologies. <laughs> Go for it. No, it's just from reading other posts, and, and I've kind of adopted that. And, and I've noticed, uh, and I've, when I replace the bladders and then I put an EI uh, MVP50 and I had to calibrate the tanks, I, I got real sci scientific about leveling the plane and, and adding a gallon at a time to calibrate the, 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 the fuel sending units. <clears throat> and uh, so since then, <clears throat> I've kept a PVC pipe and, it, and basically it, it's, it's not scientific, but I go around the back of the plane and I put my back under the airplane and I just lift it up as high as I can get it. And that's the, and that's the length of PVC, PVC pipe I put under the, under the uh, tail tie down. And I prop it up, and I get a lot of questions. People always ask, you know, what are you doing? Uh, it makes a huge difference. And uh, I think I get at least two or three gallons more propping that tail up than I do not. Uh, at least two gallons. So, um, you know, when it comes down to a couple of gallons, or it, you know, if you're coming in on fumes, God forbid, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of nice to have. Uh, and while we've but, got you, Daniel, uh, do you want to go ahead and ask your question about the O2 canister? Uh, you had written, for those who have a smaller O2 canister, what do you suggest for size on a three plus hour flight? Uh, you've got a seven liter bottle, but it doesn't last long with two or three people on it. Oh yeah. No, I just didn't know if anybody had any opinions on that. I, I bought, it's either a six or a seven liter canister. <clears throat> and when I use it by myself, it seems to go pretty quick. And of course, with anybody else on it, it goes that much quicker. What, um, what, do, you, what do you set for pressure? I, uh, or, or, excuse me, flow rate. Yeah, I'm not in my hangar. I've got the... Uh, Uh, I, can't, I, I, I can't remember exactly what, what it is. It's, it's the latest where you, where you dial it in based on your altitude, if, if, that, if that helps anything. And maybe that's where hey, I'm going wrong. Uh, you might, my, mine tells me below 18,000 use 0.5 <clears throat> as the flow rate. And uh, <laughs> if you're using more than that, you might be wasting some. Over, yeah. Yeah, a question okay. from Matt that I think a lot of people have: What RPM do you use when flying at forty percent and fifty percent power, and uh, what's the lowest RPM you'll cruise at? Okay, uh, at the higher altitudes, the uh, my plane does not like the twenty one hundred, so I'm usually at twenty two hundred. You know, at, at twelve thirteen thousand, I can go back to twenty one hundred, and it, it's it seems fine, but if I'm up at 16 or 17 or 18, uh, 2100, it it doesn't feel it. It feels like it's lugging, like it's like it's not happy. Mm. At 2200, it's a lot smoother. So, um, and I I understand you can go below that. I mean, the the that engine doesn't mind being over square. But uh, 
I, I try to go to what feels good. My, I'm, I'm approaching 2,500 hours on this engine and I'm hoping to go to 3,000. Uh, but I try to try to take care of it all the way. I use the same idea of, of reducing the RPMs to you know get to better economy. And what I do is uh, with the, the throttle firewall, I pull back the RPM to about 21 and watch the indicated airspeed. It usually goes up at that point. And then if I wanted to get even more economy, I'll dial back a little farther on the RPM. If the airspeed starts to go down, that's when I stop dialing back. See, Jeff. That's, yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good way of doing it. So go ahead. Uh, go yeah, ahead, Gomer. This is, this is Gomer. I wanted to ask Daniel a question. For my knowledge, um, I haven't had an oxygen tank since about 1998 because I don't routinely fly high. But when I bought mine, it was an Aerox tank, and it had a device on it so that it would tr be triggered by your breaths. Mm. In other words, it's not a continuous flow. And the idea was that it would save the oxygen bottle. Is that the kind of system people have now or is it just all continuous? Wouldn't know the correct answer to that. Demand oxygen is what, uh, you know, in the Air Force we used, of course, uh, you know, in high performance uh, fighter aircraft Civilian have no idea about that. Uh, I've used continuous flow, which seems to work okay. Well, I was, yeah, yeah I, I wanted to know what kind Daniel had. Yeah, it's, yeah, I've got the continuous flow. I don't have demand, but it's, it's, uh, it's the bubble, you know, it's the tube with, 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 with the ball, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, obviously, like most of them are, and I just dial it into the altitude that I'm flying. Are the demand systems popular now, or yes, they're not. Uh, what we well, start with the tube with a ball that's mountain high. I'm pretty familiar with these different systems. Yes, they're they're both mountain high and Aerox and Skyox they have a system, and it's basically it's with a, a pulse system that when the pressure when you start to breathe in there's a reduction in pressure it just gives a pulse of oxygen so you're metering it out it effectively doubles the amount of time about doubles the amount of time you can go on the bottle um whereas constant flow you if you just have a straight medical cannula just the plain old like the ones you get in the hospital you're wasting about 60 percent of the oxygen so that's why they offer though you've probably seen those weird things that they have a like a mustache, a little mustache um, uh, plastic thing on the cannula. What that does is you set the setting low, the flow, let's say like half a liter, and a, oxygen builds up in that little mustache sac. So when you breathe in, you're breathing in the oxygen that would otherwise vent, just be venting if you were in a regular medical that, one. That's that'll exactly save you about what I have that Mark described. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that'll yeah, save you about that's what I was speaking of. I wondered if that would help Daniel extend his time. Oh, they will. They're cheap. Those little mustache things are about, I think they're about per cannula, about 20 bucks or something. That's about right. The, yep. pulse, system's, the pulse system's about 500. And they have both portable and built in. They work exactly the same. They're pretty sophisticated. I mean, they work very well. Now, I've learned from using that oxygen concentrator, which is obviously a very expensive machine, but it has pulse. And the pulse is very adequate. I mean, I can stay at 92 with the machine set at, at you know, one liter a minute pulse. And that's not a lot, but it's plenty adequate. Yeah. Right. And actually, I just want to... Uh, one second, I just want to throw into the conversation a comment Eric Jones made that um, he'll stay up uh, during the daytime um, uh, up to 14,000 and he's good, but he uses O2 above 10,000 feet at night and he said it's like turning on a switch. Go ahead, Hank. Uh, yes, I have one of those pulse systems and I get 21 person hours at uh, 14,000 feet. That's wow. awesome. 
That's <clears throat> awesome. Yeah, if you have a flow system, you might consider one other factor. The weight difference between a little tank and a big tank is really quite minimal. And if you're on a trip, FBOs absolutely rob you refilling that tank. <laughs> and that's a real good reason to have the bigger tank so you don't have to refill it at, you know, El Bandito FBO. <laughs> Where are you guys uh, getting your tanks filled now? Yeah. Fill them ourselves, actually. It's, if you get a bunch of guys together, you can buy a tank for about 100 bucks. The transfer equipment's about 75 bucks. Mm. And you can fill them yourself. Yeah. So for a joint investment of $200, you can fill tanks for years. Yeah, you, you want to have at least two tanks, though. Yes. One, one, one for volume and one for pressure. Exactly right. And then when your when your uh, pressure one starts going down, you make it the volume one, and you refill the one that was your volume one, make it the pressure one. But two or three Phillips and an FBO will buy you all you need to do it yourself. You can rent the tanks too. Uh, really, uh, what you need is the uh, the gauges and the, uh, the the piping. Yeah, I just go to my well. Uh, neighborly and run by a good friend uh, welding shop and fill it because it all comes out of the same place yeah exactly yep. right yeah that's that's where mine always came from was a welding shop yeah. and i and i rented the tanks from them and he, uh they will always have tanks uh, uh first thing we do is hook onto his welding uh that he's got on the cart the welding cart because it's already pretty, pretty low pressure, and we can get a lot of volume. And then we find another one that's higher, and then finally one to top it off. <laughs> yep. there, was, uh, uh, there was certification for oxygen. Uh, medical oxygen uh, in there. supposedly has lower moisture content than the stuff you pull, uh, pull up at the welding shop. Welding shop may or may not have the lowest uh, uh, moisture content same as medical oxygen, but it's not guaranteed, whereas medical oxygen presumably is. Hmm. Uh, it would be nice to have the extra, the extra humidity. In other words, if the welding actually has higher humidity, that would be gentler on you as a person. Uh, since you're not really worried about, does it have to do with corroding the tanks or the equipment or? Having the extra it's, humidity, or is it just the, the comfort of the user? Yeah, the dryness was to prevent freezing in B-17s, as I recollect. Oh, uh, okay. uh, World War II, would the the uh, the moisture would freeze in the oxygen lines. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. I don't know if that's accurate, but that's what somebody told me once. You know, hey, Ron, this, I, uh, Ron, go I, ahead, Robert. Robert Klein, I got a question for you. At the altitudes that you're flying. Have you considered uh, electronic mags? I think they would make a significant difference for you up at that altitude. I fly 180, and when we came across the Rockies at 14,000, uh, we were just screaming along, and I really think the electronic mags make a significant difference. Yeah. Go ahead, Ron. What What do you are you asking me to comment on that? Well, <laughs> it, it, it sounds like you don't have electronic. <laughs> have you considered uh, making that making that change for all the the amount of time you you spend above eight thousand feet? Uh, I think you would see not only a fuel flow improvement, but uh, we were actually getting at fourteen thousand feet. I was actually getting higher manifold pressure that's in, than that's in the book. I was off the scale than from what's in the book because it's such a, a more efficient burn. <clears throat> so uh, I have the shower of sparks, so I'd have to just put it on the right mag rather than the left mag? You can replace your shower of sparks mag with the electronic ignition from ElectroAir. I'm not sure about Surefly. Does anybody know? I did Surefly this past summer and I, I'm glad Robert uh, segued into that. I absolutely could not be more happy with it. It's absolutely fabulous. It's an easy install. 
the the plane starts like it was brand new. Uh, and all the all the things that people talk about, the fuel savings and the uh, easy starts, et cetera, hot starts is is absolutely correct. And which I have which brand was that? You say Surefly? Sure, Surefly. Yeah, I think were, were they just bought out with somebody by somebody? I'm not sure, but uh, Surefly I think is the name that and I that remember. And you replaced your left mag. Left mag. Yeah, the impulse coupled mag. Oh. And uh, it's you know you, you there there are dip switches, uh, and I I don't know if they have. Been approved yep, they're for, approved now for the Comanche. The dip switches. Earlier they, this year, they were not. They were uh, TSO'd, but now the Surefly is approved for electronic yeah. ignition for the Comanches. But so, for the advanced uh, timing is what I was wondering. It with the advanced timing. Yep. No, that's been oh, approved. Oh really? Okay, yep. good. Oh, that's yep. fantastic. I did not know that. Yeah. Well, I got yep, to go no, back. At first, it wasn't, <laughs> but now it is. Yeah. Uh, and actually, Surefly um, offered us a group buy special. Um, we had a couple of odd incidents happen where we had got all this stuff negotiated with Electra and Surefly, and then we got a letter, and that kept us from from doing it. But actually, just the last couple of days, I started to reach out to say, hey, can we still do that? It was 10% off from Surefly, and then Electra Air was offering us a really uh amazing deal. And part of the reason that that was important to all of us is that those Tempest spark plugs yeah. um we're part of that so okay. the fine wires and uh, and the and the massives i have the uh, electro air system on my twin um, mm -hmm. so i'm not familiar it sounds like that the single comanches on their io 540s and what the 180s yes the there's the four IO cylinder and the six cylinders yeah mm -hmm. uh sounds like they have one impulse coupled mag on twin comanche has dual impulse cu coupled mags so um, I chose to put the Electro Air uh, magnetic timing housing that replaces the magneto physically in that slot on the right side. And I'm running uh, an Im impulse coupled standard mag on the left side. But I also put a sure start on that mag. And I can't mm -hmm. say that that made any difference, but because uh, you can put a sure start on a slick mag. We actually have a, an upcoming zoom on uh, electronic ignition. You know, look forward to. Mm -hmm. I have yep. the Electro Air on my uh, 250 Comanche, and it's everything they claim it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the Hank, Electro Air on, is a. Oh, go ahead. On on your 250, Hank, did you was it uh, shower sparks, and did you replace the left mag? Uh, I believe so. So what, did you have to change the switch then? Oh, uh, yes, you changed the switch. Okay. Yeah. So, it's so the Electro Air, yeah, exactly. The Electro Air group by, um, the first one that we did included, uh, it was kind of a package deal, uh, including even shipping and handling, and it included um, the electronic ignition, you know, so the change out for the mag, and the the pitch the switch on the panel so that and you know you you would no longer be using your key, uh -huh. and then uh, a set of fine wire or massive wire plugs depending on whether it was the four cylinder or the six cylinder. Um, and so the one that they were that we were that we didn't announce but that was negotiated allowed you to separately purchase the electronic ignition, the switch and the uh, and the and the plugs. For the twins, because the twins come with a switch and never had a keyed ignition, they had some other nice thing for the twins, and I just don't remember what it was. And then for um, the Surefly, which is a, uh, a somewhat simpler replacement, um, you know, lower time to install and less expensive to buy, uh, they were planning to just do a straight, uh, you know, if we had 10 Comanches buying it, there would be a discount for all of us. So... And then they require that you go, anybody remember who's done Surefly is that you have to have a slick harness. So if yeah. you've got a Bendix harness, you switch it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the case. Uh, yeah, you have, to, you have to buy a slick harness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless you've already got slick bags. Correct. 
Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, well, there's some other great comments and questions. Um, the uh, let's see, uh, Emmanuel, you already put in your note about being aware of the risk of deep vein thrombosis uh, with extended flights, especially as we get older. Um, the uh, uh, Clement also mentioned just be ready for an emergency, uh, and then he had had one in Mexico, had an extra extra day, didn't panic, and ATC in Mexico was fantastic, but just kind of to be aware that those things can happen on these long, long flights. Um, Clement, do you want to add anything to that before I jump to the next? Yeah, basically we were just going over the mountains, to going into uh, Oaxaca, and uh, and the batteries went dead in my uh, portable uh, intercom, and there was a great big bang in my headset, and I thought I had lost, lost something underneath the canopy but uh it just just happened and uh, i declared emergency in mexico city just uh turned me back to tampico and uh you know it's just a weird feeling when you're coming into land to the, the airport and uh, the fire trucks are there the the, the yeah. ambulance and uh you know every everything else that they can pull out and uh, but it's okay it, it was an exciting thing uh, <laughs> kind, of, kind of messed up the our our, our trip for a day but it just uh, was uh, a learning experience. Just don't panic. There's a lot of people out there that can help you. Yeah. Well said. Um, and just uh, from Bill, I believe this may be Bill Kniff, that uh, he, he praised the presentation and mentioned that uh, it just his recall of experiences doing long distance flying with unexpected icing and weather, especially doing long patrols for the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary. Um, Ron, do you want to comment at all on icing in long distance flying? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll make a couple comments about that. One is, uh, you know, I've, I've been flying with an occasion, got maybe an inch to two of rhyme on leading edges, which, believe it or not, does not have a big effect on the Comanche. Not like clear. I've mm -hmm. I've gone through a wisp of the clouds right at the top uh, and got a, a a dose of clear, and immediately I lose 15 knots to airspeed and as much ground speed. Um, if I'm flying, number one, I I try to do a good job of pre-flight planning to know where the ice is. And now with uh, ForeFlight having that ice information real time while you're flying, it's a big help. But mostly in Michigan in the wintertime, you can fly above it. So all you have to do is get through it. It's usually one or 2,000 feet uh, thick. And uh, you fly up through it, get on top. And, and top's usually 4,000 feet. So even mm -hmm. if you're flying fairly low, you're above it. And then you get some coming down. In December and March are the worst times to fly up here. There, um, it the layer may be five or six or eight thousand foot, uh, but usually there's layers. So if uh, if it's like that, I'll try to find a layer. I will not fly in ice at night. I only fly in the daytime where I can. You know, I've got the pre-flight briefing. I've got the uh, the pilot reports, the pyreps, and I got my eyes to tell me where where the ice is. And <laughs> now, of course, for flight telling me. Uh, but I I will only fly in that condition if I have two to three outs, and outs are left, right, up, or down, you know, or find a layer. Mm. Um, uh, could I say something, CJ? Oh, by all means, please. Oh, I, yeah, Ron has way more flight experience me, than me, but we both fly around and in, in the ice occasionally. And I just think that, that he gives really good advice. And uh, for flight, I found the icing chart that he mentioned before that you can scroll the button on the right side to give you the icing layers. I found that just like Ron to be really, really accurate. 
I was flying up to uh, Minneapolis from Southwest Michigan, so I go across Lake Michigan. And um, on the way there, it was in the winter, around Christmas time, and uh, I could see that there was ice, like it. 6,000 feet, but above that there was no ice, and then there was ice at 8,000 feet. And so I could fly above the ice layer, and um, there was a temperature inversion. So it was actually warmer where I was than it was below me. And so as I got farther north, um, the temperature kept dropping to where I was, I wasn't in, I had to start going into clouds in order to stay at my altitude. And I got down to zero and um, I didn't pick up any ice whatsoever. So even though I was in the clouds and I had a way out because I could just descend. And then on the way there, the controller was very helpful because they pointed out that there was an area of precipitation that was gonna be right in my way. And I said, well, could I get a vector? And they said, she said, sure. And so they vectored me around about 30 degrees out of the way because I knew that I was, if it was raining, that I would be, I would be super cooled because I was mm. below freezing then. And I made it to Minneapolis and there was supposed to be a big store, snowstorm coming in. I got there 30 minutes before the snow ever hit. So I never got any ice. Whereas if you looked at the forecast, it looked kind of like, whoa, hey, you know, kind of I've iffy. I've got a Go ahead. question along those lines uh, and, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong and this has been bugging me for the past few years uh, back in the 80s when I got my license I, I remember